Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to propose a research program. Um, by that, I mean um, I'm going to fix on a particular problem. I'm going to suggest, I propose to the community, the research community, a particular way of attacking this problem. And it's supposed to be definitive. You know, if the program succeeds, we'll be done with this problem uh, forever and ever. Um, specifically, the, the problem is an old one, uh, cash misses. Uh, there's a, no, every, every now and then you see another paper, but this, this, this is a problem that goes back many, many years. So it's an old problem, and um, I'm, supposed, uh, I'm proposing something that I believe is going to be a def definitive attack on the problem. So it's kind of ambitious. So let's see how far I can push this. Um, this is done together with Zhou Ming and Zhen Dingwen and Liu Yi and uh, Huing Feng Qing, who did all the hard work of getting the data. So it's about Mears equations. And um, what's new about the way I'm approaching this problem is that I'm going at it uh, top down rather than bottom up. So first, I need to explain what I mean by that. And it's definitive uh, in a sense that uh, is in order to be definitive, is is I believe it's got to be universal. So I, I need to explain what I mean by that as well. Uh, once I do that, then I can I can explain what the program is about. And in our business, every time we come up with something, there's always the question, what's the use? What's the use? So I need to tell you a bit about uh, what's the use if the program succeeds. So. It's about the cash miss equation. So first of all, what is a cash miss equation? It's just uh, uh, the, the expresses the probability of a cash miss as a function of the cash size. Um, so cash here, um, one of the, the things ambitious about this program is that I'm not attacking any particular one level of the memory hierarchy, I'm saying that this is the way to attack any level of the, uh, of the hierarchy. So cache here has a very, uh, uh, is, is very general. I, you could refer to the processor cache, the RAM, um, database buffer, web proxy, etc. Size, uh, memory is cheap. Maybe size is not an issue. No, I still think that it is an issue for various reasons. Um, even if you have a large amount of memory, uh, one of the things that is uh, coming back to Vogue now is virtualization. With virtualization, you still have to allocate the big memory to various virtual machines, so we have to decide how much to give to any one of them. So size is an issue there. Um, if you're talking about consumer electronics, for example, if you, you have a it's something year big, and you cannot just simply add memory if you want to. So again, size is still an issue. Um, for guys like you, uh, no, certainly for consumer electronics, energy is an issue. But even for, for Google, energy is also an issue because idle memory uh, is going to consume a lot of energy as well. So I think size is still an issue. Um, now. Although I wrote that equation, um, or that e equation expresses the probability of a miss as a function of the cache size, actually there are a couple of other things that determine the probability of a miss, and namely the reference pattern and the uh, management policy. So um, the reference pattern, for example, you know, it is a hard problem. And I'm, this, this slide is supposed to explain to you why this is a very hard problem. So, one of the things hard about it is that it depends on the reference pattern de might depend on the hardware variation that, that you have. You know, whether, whether I'm talking about the data cache or the instruction cache, for example, and whether you are using multi-core threading. Uh, it depends on the uh, layout, whether you are, you know, what, what is your page size, whether you have an index uh, on, on your data. Uh, the application mix, you know, are your processes pipeline or are they running concurrently? If they are running concurrently, do they lock each other out, for example? That's going to affect your uh, reference pattern. Uh, no, 
what version of the OS you are using, uh, what compiler options do you have prefetching turned on. And the data instance, uh, at one point somebody told me that the biggest buyers of uh, uh, supercomputing are actually Walmart and Citibank. And these people, for these people, their data is always changing. So the reference pattern is continually changing. So you, if you try to model that, that's going to be a big challenge. And the whole thing just depends on how you configure it, right? Uh, you no, know, do you have level two, level three caches? No, these are going to affect one another. Uh, do you have service level agreements that you have to satisfy? So when you look at this whole shebang, it's just not trackable. There are just not enough equations you can write that will completely describe the interactions here. And if you could write enough equations to describe this, you cannot solve it. So what, what have people been doing? So what they do is what I call uh, bottom-up analysis. They start off with very simple assumptions about what is happening. So uh, typically, they'll fix on in some idealized replacement policy, let's say LRU, assume there's no prefetching, et cetera. So you have some uh, nice, clean uh, re uh, policy to deal with. Then they assume there's independence in the reference pattern, and maybe there's just one process. And, and uh, uh, so you have a very simple reference pattern. You simplify this, you simplify that. That makes understanding the interaction much simpler. Now you can write your equation. Now, of course, the question is, you have this reality here and this model here. How close are you to the reality? So this kind of bottom-up analysis requires um, an expert. No, you, you, need to know, you need to know what is a reasonable approximation, uh, what, what, what is a, uh, an OK assumption, and what is not. So you need the expertise, especially is if uh, you, you, you have this particular model and you're trying to customize it. right? Uh, even if you build a model for this particular shebang, and then some, you, know, you have another customer that says, no, I also want your model, and, but this, his, his hardware is slightly different, his software is slightly different. How are you going to customize that model to to, to that uh, different configuration, you need an expert to, who, who is able to do that. And even if you have already a model, and then tomorrow you decide to buy a faster hardware or you ch decide to uh, upgrade the software, now how, how, does, how, is, how is your model supposed to reflect that? Um, this requires a lot of work. It's not scalable. In fact, things are so bad nowadays that um, People at like IBM and Microsoft, they have been pushing for autonomic computing, where they want everything to be automatically configurable and adjust to uh, changes in workload automatically. Now, I think about a model that's trying to do that, you know, automatically configure and adjust automatically, uh, is just hopeless. The situation is hopeless. So my point is, let's forget this. Um, it has not taken us very far in the last 40 years. It's gonna, not going to take us much further. Forget it. Let's do it a different way. So instead of this bottom up, no, assume, 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 and then build up uh, the model this way, let's start from the top and, and do it down. So, so how, how to start from the top down? Um, you find one equation that will work for everything. Okay. Um, well, work for everything? No, where's the magic? So the magic is, instead of the probability of a miss as a function of cache size, I give you a small number of parameters to play with. How does that help you? Well, if, there is, if, if you, if you, if you uh, have built your model for, for, for this particular configuration, and then you want to uh, adapt the model for a different configuration, that just means changing the parametric values. Or if you have a model for this and you change the hardware, you change the software, that just changes the parametric values. You want to automatically configure it, change the parametric values, uh, not just not change the, but no, you can calibrate on, on the fly the parametric values. Okay. And uh, you want to adjust it because there's a flash crowd, well, okay, dynamically change the parametric values. So all the magic is going to go into the parametric values. 
all the while the same equation applies. Okay, so this is what I mean by universal. A same equation, um, but uh, with values of, with a small number of parameters and the values change according to the circumstance. So this is the goal, right? Have one equation that will work for everything. What, what might it look like? So instead of the probability of miss, let me write a different version. Let's uh, you know, do a map and, and just express the number of misses as a function of the cache size m. And in this case, just four parameters. And it's the, the, the version, the particular version that I'm going to show here is very simple. Uh, the hardest thing about it is the square root. No, nothing fancy. What do all the, what do the four parameters, so this one is the cache size here. What do the four parameters mean? Okay, so um, if you plot the number of misses against the uh, cache size, uh, you see that uh, as cache size increases, the number of misses decreases. Um, so the n star here is the cold miss, right? As when, when, your, when, your mem when your memory size or cache size gets large enough, at some point, it will stop going down. And all you're doing is catching the cold misses. So this is the lower bound, and that's the, the, the n star there. And then the n naught here is the uh, vertical asymptote. There is uh, some minimal amount of memory that you need in order to run your workload. You, you couldn't push it uh, all the way to zero. So this, this one is uh, the vertical asymptote is the M not there. Okay. Um, no. How different is this from previous equations? One of the critical difference between this and previous ones. Now, previous equations uh, typically is use a power law. So it's, uh, some, some inverse polynomial, and it, it goes on and on and on infinitely, keeps on going infinitely. Uh, decreasing infinitely. Um, it doesn't identify some maximum memory beyond which uh, the, uh, the number of misses doesn't, doesn't drop. So this is the one difference between this and this, and this guy here is the M star here. It's kind of the ideal M, you know, there's no point in going beyond here because you're not going to reduce the number of misses any further, and, there's, uh, and if you are lower than this, then you're going to take some hits. Uh, take a hit, you're going to get some misses. Okay. So the only parameter left is the n naught. Now, it's hard for me to explain what n naught actually is. Um, you can think, in, in, think of it as the parameter that captures uh, some critical aspects of uh, the reference pattern, uh, like whether you do prefetching. No, the, not, the, not the, some critical aspect of the replacement algorithm, like uh, whether you do prefetching and uh, whether you do dynamic allocation, for example. If you are doing a compile and you do you dynamic, dynamically allocate some space, uh, that's going to come in the n naught. So n naught, the way n naught came into being was when we looked at those issues. But geometrically, you can think of n naught as speci specifying the curvature of this curve. And you see in the next, when I show you the data, that uh, this n naught um, actually can is flexible enough to give you uh, very different shapes. So let me let me just show you the the, the data. So in this one, what we did was uh, run seven spec benchmarks on Linux. Uh, this is not a simulation. This we actually me measure the page I page I O, and we change the RAM size for this. So this is the, the data, and the equation uh, gives a pretty good fit for, for the, for the uh, data. This is the horizontal, uh, horizontal asymptote n star, the vertical asymptote m naught. Uh, m star is here, the maximum memory. And this particular curvature is specified by the n naught. OK. Now, being a spec benchmark, this one is uh, obviously a compute-intensive workload. How about something I/O intensive? So outside of campuses like this, real people use don't use Linux; they use Windows. So we wanted a, a, a workload that uh, is uh, uh, uses this uh, interactive 
way of uh, using the system. So we had Windows 2000, and we ran, uh, we, we, we ran a, the Business Winstone. Business Winstone is a benchmark where they log some user clicking here and there with something like 12 applications, you know, cut and paste from here to there, icons, etc. all kinds of operations. We take this log, and then we play it back at different memory sizes. Okay. And again, you see a good fit between the equation and the data. The did you have more data going past MSR? Did I have more data yeah. going past, like this one? Yeah, so if you, if you remember, um, if you compare the curvature here and the curvature previously, you see uh, there is a, a, a big difference in the curvature. And this one is I/O intensive because the if you just look at the the, the horizontal or symptote is already very high. Now, these days, um, so so uh, this this is very nice. But we wanted uh, to challenge the model uh, more aggressively in the following way. Um, if you if you have you no know, people do Java and Python and C sharp, whatever, this garbage collected. Uh, uh, applications. The, prob the trouble or the, 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 the hard part about modeling this kind of applications is that the, the reference pattern changes with the memory size. See, the, old, the, the, the typical bottom-up way, bottom way of analyzing um, the interaction between the reference pattern and the, the page replacement algorithm is you assume uh, a particular reference pattern model. Okay, and then you say, okay, the reference pattern looks like this, and it stays that way uh, regardless of the memory size. But that's just not so in the case of garbage collected uh, applications. So here, what we had was Windows 2000 again, but we uh, used Java, and this one is uh, very memory intensive. You see this, the, the steep curve, uh, which is very different from the other two that we saw. Yeah. And still the, 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 the model can cope. So we are pretty happy with this. But remember, uh, I want this thing to be universal. Universal means that it has to apply to anything. Right? In particular, it has to, the equation has to work for different replacement algorithms. What I've done is try different uh, 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 re uh, reference patterns, so now I want it I want to check whether it works for different replacement algorithms. So here we have a Linux workload, and we <coughs> patch the kernel to try different uh, replacement policies. So here we have FIFO and, and, and random, and this one is the stock kernel. And so you have three different data sets, and the equation can fit the three different data sets with different vertical asymptotes and different M0 values. The N star doesn't change because um, is that's a property of the reference pattern and not a property of the replacement algorithm. Now, the other thing that, um, that motivated me just now uh, was that if you have, you, know, you want an equation such that even if your hardware changes or your software changes, you can still use the same equation. So let's just check that out. So here, what we did was, um, Tried. So this curve and this curve both use the same Linux kernel, but uh, we did, so this is a GCC compilation benchmark. We changed the, the GCC version, and the equation changes shape according to the data. And for this and this, what we did was same GCC version, but we changed the kernel. Now, between 2.2 and 2.4, there was a drastic change in the kernel, and the equation reflects that. So I think it looks pretty good in the sense that, you, we, you know, even though you, you know, if, if you have some software versions that go from you know, version 1 to version 2, all you have to do when you are, you are dealing with this equation is just change the parametric values without having to reanalyze the whole thing. Okay. Where's the magic? 
how is it that this one equation can fit all of these uh, uh, different circumstances? So I need to give you some intuition for this, and this is the intuition. So let's say um, T rem here is the um, average time between entry into rem and eviction. So think of the timeline here. Think about one page. A page comes into RAM, there's a cold miss, the page comes into RAM, sits there for a while, get evicted, and then there's a, there's a reference and comes back in, goes out, comes back in, like this. So the black parts are where it's in RAM. You take the average of that, that gives you the T RAM. And the white parts are when it's on this, take the average of that, that gives you the T disk. And R is the number of times uh, you come into RAM. Okay. Now, what I need to do is look at the probability that you read a page that has been evicted. So one way to look at it is, imagine that the references are uniformly distributed on this line. Then what's the, if, if, if the reference comes in here, then there's going to be a miss. If the reference comes in here, there's going to be a hit. So the probability of a miss is just naively uh, the white part over the whole line, like this. The other way to look at it is, um, the first one is a cold miss. You don't count that. Uh, because here, I'm talking about a page that was previously replaced. So cold miss doesn't count. So you subtract that one. So it's r minus 1 over r. That's, that will give you the p. So you have this two. You massage that. You have this uh, one equation here. And this one equation, notice that in, in deriving this, this one equation, I did not make any assumption about the reference pattern nor any assumption about the uh, replacement policy. So I, call, I grandly call this the references plus replacement invariant. So the hardest part about analyzing cache misses is this interaction between the reference pattern and, and, the, and the replacement policy. And here I have an equation that is independent, that, 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 that appears to be invariant you know, regardless of which one you use for this or that, uh, it's supposed to, to, to still work. That's why I call it the, the invariant. Once you have this, you just add Little's law, one of the standard results from queuing theory, uh, do a bit of uh, juggling around, and you, you get the equation. It's not too difficult. You can imagine going from the R value, from the R value to the N value. So that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the derivation behind the, behind the equation. When, in, in, when, when I describe the, the, the intuition, I, in fact, did not say anything about the reference pattern, right? It's, it could have been references to a database buffer, let's say. Okay. So yeah, let's try, check. You know, would it work when, when I'm talking about, not, at, not, not, not about uh, 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 RAM, but talking about a database buffer, some application uh, object like this one. So here we took um, some traces. Well, this data generated from real traces taken on uh, commercial workloads. So these guys uh, have access to uh, IBM's uh, database machines, and they had like 12 traces from some huge companies. They did not specify exactly what those companies are, but were, but uh, you can guess between the lines, they were things like AT&T and, &T and, and you know, IBM's own uh, workloads, etc. So these are huge workloads. Um, and we did a simulation, and well, actually the data came from them, and we just checked whether the equation would fit their data. And it seems that it, it fits very well. Now notice that in real data, the, 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 the data is not going to ni come down nicely with uh, one, you know, uh, the curvature is not going to be nice and nice like this. You know, it's going to be you know up. The, the curvature is going to change one way this way, one way. You know, it's this kind of waterfall behavior. The equation can't catch that. Um, if you analyze the equation, the equation only has one change in curvature. So what? So you cannot catch this kind of multiple changes in curvature. But so what? What the equation can do is to do its best uh, when you, if you have uh, multiple changes in curvature. Yeah. So that's one of the weakness of the equation. If it works for the database buffer, no, why won't it work for a database uh, for a web cache? So here, 
uh, we took some traces from one of the websites in China. This is supposed to be a largest peer-to-peer -peer website. You know, a lot of naughty stuff going on there. Um, and the fit is very nice. So I'm optimistic that this thing works for ca uh, web caching as well. Um, one, one, thing, one thing about uh, web caching is um, I, I, I actually don't know whether the particular trace the student picked for this has this property, but for web caching, um, there are these additional issues about some file sizes are you know, very big relative to, to, to others, and uh, some, there, there's this zip distribution that where some uh, uh, data, some files are, re there are many, many files that are rarely uh, accessed. So there are some differences in uh, reference pattern from the standard ones, but the equation seems not to worry about this. Okay, so remember my objective was to get one equation to work for all kinds of workload, all kinds of replacement policies, and I've only shown you the good news, right, uh, up to this point. But it's unlikely that, uh, that, that this will work all the time. So <clears throat> this is what the, where the, pro the research program proposal comes in. I have enough data to give me optimism that this particular approach to the problem is feasible. So let's see uh, what, is, what, 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 what will work in general. So I propose that instead of this 40-year-old strategy of bottom-up analysis, let's do it the other way around. Do it at top-down. And for every cache type, whether it's database buffer or, or process cache, cache or whatever, let's derive just one equation for each level of the memory hierarchy. Okay. So that's the program. So in, in a case, if, if, the, if, if I'm talking about the RAM or the database buffer or the pro web proxy, I show you that this particular equation works. Right. But if you have something like a set associative cache, surely it's not going to work. Very simple reason, because the, the equation that I showed you is one dimensional. There's just, just the M, the cache size. But for a set associative cache, it's two-dimensional. You have the number of sets and you have the associativity. So you have to explicitly uh, uh, reflect this, this two-dimensional characteristic in the equation. So the previous equation that I showed you is not going to work. So what, what might work? My current favorite is this one. So here I need five parameters. The A here is the Colmis. Um, so the, the, remember the, 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 so this the associativity, uh, associativity and this number of sets, these are two dimensions. The A here is the co-miss. P1 here is the probability of a miss if your line, if, if your cache has only one line. Okay. Um, and then this one here is a stack distance, some standard measurement, standard parameter for reference patterns. And the F and H here are supposed to capture the locality of the reference pattern. Okay. So we tested this. No, it, just, it, it, it has to be universal, right? So we tested this on the data cache as well as the instruction cache. And it seems to work. Uh, you notice that for, for the data cache, uh, the data cache pat reference patterns and instruction cache reference patterns are quite different. For instruction cache reference patterns, there are many, many models out there. You know, because you can assume it's a loop, it's a recursion, whatever, you know, it's a matrix or what, and, and you can analyze that. But for the data cache, well, if you are doing tree traversal or pointer uh, here and there, then it's pretty random, so it's very hard to analyze. So despite the two different ref kinds of reference behavior, uh, the, this equation holds up. But I don't want to overclaim. Um, we took the traces from this particular website, and I found the traces to be not very challenging. Um, so I, I'm pre pre prepared to concede that this is not the right equation, and, and we, we need a different equation. Okay, the, the purpose of this talk is just to propose this way of attacking the problem, and I don't claim that the particular equations that I have are, in fact, the right ones. Yeah. So I've explained all the keywords except 
this top-down modeling. Well, what do I mean by top-down modeling? Okay, so remember this equation that, that I have, right? And it's, I, I, showed, I showed you some data that, that says that it works for the database buffer. But there's something wrong, there, there's something missing from this equation. At least in, in the old days, I, I'm not too clear about what people worry about nowadays, but when you're talking about a database workload, they are interested in questions of the following kind. Suppose I have this server running this workload, um, M uh, transactions running concurrently. Suppose I increase M to 2M, okay, so M is the multi-programming level. Suppose I double the multi-programming level, how would that impact the performance? Okay, so they're, 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 th the, they're, they're interested in questions of this sort. But there's no way, in, in this equation doesn't have this kind of an M in it. There's none of the parameters refer to the multi-programming level. So to reflect that in the equation, I have this other equation. So in this other equation, this one is the M. Okay, M is not a right, good, good thing. Uh, number of transactions. Okay, so it's the, num the, the multi-programming level, and each transaction makes so many requests to so many records. And the equation will look like this. Yeah. And it's quite obvious that this equation was derived from that equation. Um, so the, the point is this. I have this equation. First, I verify that this equation works for anything universal. Now, if there's some aspect of the workload that I want to be explicitly reflected in the parameters, then what I will do is I will analyze how those parameters up there depend on these other parameters, and then I refine those parameters into other set of parameters, including the one that, that you're interested in, in this case, the multi-programming level. Okay. So, and and if, if that's not enough, you want to refine further, you just go down some more. So this is what I mean by uh, a top-down approach, rather than assume, assume, and build, it, build the model up this way. Yeah. Okay. So let me give you some examples of what you can get out of equations like this one. So energy, right? A popular issue uh, nowadays. So um, in the case of mobile devices, you want to save battery. In the case of large data centers that like what you guys have, you want to save money on the electricity budget. All right? So um, how, what does the equation do for you? So remember this example that I have just now? The M star here is sort of like, you, you don't need more than this. So the idea, of course, is to shut down any excess memory beyond that. But in order to do that, you need to, you need to have an estimate of what M star is. And the old equation just doesn't give you that. So uh, what, what does my equation do for you? Well, let's say we have three data sets like this. And then you just fit, you just fit the, the three data sets with the equation what you get is three sets of parameters, and the M star for the three sets of parameters are, are there. You know, the, the M star is not anywhere on, on, on this curve. You know, it's somewhere out here. Right? But the equation, you, you will appear in the equation once you do the fit. Okay. Um, so at this point, it's for me to ask the question. Right? When I presented this thing at, in Beijing to the Microsoft people, they have an interesting uh, spin on the problem. So the guy who talked to me was actually somebody working on BitVault. BitVault is some archival system, distributed, um, huge amount of servers. And um, because it's the huge number of servers, you can be sure that there are always some of them going down. So because some of them are going down, uh, you want replication. So if you have a huge number of servers with replication, and they're all up, uh, so they are burning up a lot of energy. So his question was um, whether you can uh, power some of them down. Because you have replicas, right? Can you power some of them down? And he wants to look at how the equation can be used to address that question. Now, it wasn't very clear to me what exactly he had in mind. And this is my best take on his question, which is that if you uh, try to go to a particular replica to retrieve a document and the replica was powered down, that counts as a miss. Okay. So
So then you have, again, you have uh, a missus. Uh, you want to find sort of like the memory, minimum memory size uh, for, for the whole system. But minimum memory size may not be a meaningful question for this particular instance. I think what you could do with the equation is that once you, once you have the equation, you can use the equation to calculate the trade-off between, if you, have a, if you have a miss in this setting, right, that costs you in terms of excess latency. So now you want to balance between excess latency and power saving. And the equation will help you do that calculation. So maybe, you know, do you think something like this will work for you guys? You guys have huge data sets as well, right? So um, I'll be happy to talk to anyone who thinks that this, this might be useful for you. OK, so this is talking about memory sizing. Um, uh, the other, so the, 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 when, when I started, I said not just sizing is an issue, but the share is also an issue. You, you, have, you might have a big memory, but you don't want to partition it, share it among workloads. You know, how much of the memory is you, you give to a particular workload? So here, here is the, you know, how can you use the equation to do this partitioning? All right. So you might want to partition the memory for optimization or to enforce certain service level agreement. All right. So let's say you partition into three and you want, let's say, just for the sake of this talk, you know, to minimize the probability of a miss, aggregate miss. Yeah. All right. So these are the three data sets that I had before. And you fit them with the equation. Once you fit them with the equation, you can use the equation now to calculate. Right? You have the aggregate, you have some aggregate uh, probability of a miss. You use the equation to calculate, and you can calculate what the miss probability would be for any partition. Right? And calculation is fast. Okay. So once you do that, you completely map the surface. Right? This is uh, one you know, it's two dimensional problem. You have two dimension, and the, the surface here is the probability of miss. It's not very clear on this particular plot, but one, I think this one is the, is the predicted one, and this one is the measured one, the real miss. And you see that the equation gives you a good approximation of the, the real miss. So what you can do with this now is you can do the optimization that you want, locate where the optimum partition is, or calculate the, the trade-off between uh, different partitions, for example. One, another thing that I, that I used to motivate this was this issue about autonomic computing. If you have a sudden change in workload, you want to react to it automatically and on, uh, 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 dynamically, how do you do that? And I said, by giving you the parameters, you can just calibrate them on the fly. So now let me give you an example. OK, so for this, um, I take the database example, TPC workload. And we change the number of terminals, um, multi-programming level, uh, cyclically. Yeah, 50, 40, 30, 50, 40, 30. So the miss probability is going to keep on changing you know, if you don't change your memory size. Right? Um, and then you have a certain target that you want to hit, some service level agreement, let's say 0 0.2, some aggregate. Um, uh, some, this is one, just, uh, just one work type, so not aggregate, but just the probability of a miss. All right, <clears throat> so this is, this time is divided into epochs here, and this is the target that you want to achieve. And if you, if, if you are stable, then because, because there's a cycle here, the probability of a miss is going to go in a cycle. Okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so there are basically three ways of, 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 doing, of doing this. One obvious idea is to do gradient descent. You take two neighboring epochs, look, so this is a certain memory size, there is a certain memory size. And you look at the P means for this two, you draw a line, you, this is your target, that tells you what the, what the target memory size should be. Right? So that's gradient descent. If you do that, <coughs> you, will get, you will converge on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, target P means, but uh, you can go through these violent uh, fluctuations for two reasons. One reason is that uh, the reference pattern, for example, has randomness in it. And that randomness is going to throw you off every now and then. And also, you know, the, the, the workload itself is already cycling. 
So that's going to perturb it some more. So because of that, you can have this uh, overshooting and undershooting, and it takes a while to converge. So one way of dealing with this is that, well, you, you have these fluctuations, let's say random fluctuations, right? You smooth them out. If you can smooth them out, the gradient descent will work better. So one way is uh, to use the equation to smooth out the fluctuations. You have this smooth curve. With this smooth curve, you calculate the gradient. That's, that's a more stable way of estimating the gradient. And sure enough, um, if you do that, then you have convergence sooner. Right? But if you have the equation, why even do gradient descent? Use the equation to calculate what the optimum, uh, what, what the target uh, memory size should be. Right? So if you use the equation to compute the target memory size, then uh, bang, in one epoch you are there. So this is how the equations can be, no, the, the calibration here happened uh, in real time. So you can do this calibration automatically, automatically and uh, uh, dynamically. Yeah. What was the dynamic variation in M that corresponds with the various epochs there? Dynamic variation. So, so you were computing M, mm -hmm. but you're displaying how accurate your miss rate was. I wondered what the overall variation of M was, given that you had a, a model behind that that was sensitive to the various number of terminals per epoch. Was it a 50% variation in? I never saw the data, so I could I couldn't okay. answer. I, I could look up the data. Yeah. Um, one of my students generated this graph, and he never he, I, I never saw the data. Uh, is that an issue? I, I just wondered if it was a small variation in percentage of that. I'm just wondering about the sensitivity um, in the mapping. Yeah. I, I should check. Thanks. OK, so this dynamic adjustment of the memory size, the next thing is the, the memory share. OK, so this one, <coughs> so this, let's say you, 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 have, um, you have some shortage of free memory. So remember, you have this uh, big memory, and you are trying to cut up this big piece of memory and allocate it to different, uh, in this case, virtual memory, virtual uh, machines. Um, and you start up another virtual machine. So suddenly, you're out of space. So you want to reclaim some of this uh, 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 allocation and give it to the new virtual machine, right? And you want to do it in some fair way, right? OK, so you, you can define. So, so here is the scenario. You, have, you are divided into three parts. And um, you start off before the reclamation from, from these three of them some unfair allocation. Right? Uh, in this particular case, you see that the pool number two is consistently, consistently has a lower p-miss ratio. Here is the, the p-miss against uh, divided by the co-miss. So that's our measure of fairness. Uh, and it's unfair in the sense that one of them consistently lower than the rest. And also the spread is big. Right? The spread is big. You, you like to narrow, narrow down this, this spread in, in, the, in, in the ratio. So if, if that be your objective, you know, you can have other definition of fairness, but if this is your definition of fairness, now what you want to do is free up some memory by taking away some from each one of them and give this to, to the new one, let's say. Okay. So you can use, once you have the equation, you can use it to calculate. And it's some kind of prorating. You can see some kind of prorating here. Except that uh, the prorating is in term, it's not, it's not in terms of m i, not a share. It's not in terms of m star, the, the optimum, so-called optimum, but in terms of this uh, a difference between m star and m naught. Okay, so remember, m naught is the vertical asymptote. M star is the optimum. So you are talking about this space, not not this space. Right? Um, you do that prorating, and according to this definition of fairness, you should, you should get what you want. So we, we did it, and after the reclamation, you see that no, no, it, it, the, the, the square, none of them is consistently the lowest, and the, uh, and the spread is smaller. Okay. So the point here is that once you have an equation, you can use it to do your calculations for your memory uh, allocation management. 
Okay. One more example. <coughs> um, autonomic computing. Um, I said that the, 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 the IBM and, and Microsoft have, have been pushing this. And in fact, the, the database people are out there on this. So the three, the major database people, they have all come up with uh, software to help people uh, configure their machines automatically. And for a database server, there are just humongous number of tuning knobs. But the, all, for all of them, one of the things that they focus on is the, uh, the buffer allocation. So all three of them have some simulator embedded to predict the number of IOs for you know, if you have a bigger buffer or a smaller buffer. And, and this, this, this is a, uh, so, so um, you, you do the simulation to do this, use simulation to do this prediction, um, so it's hard coding. Right? So it's very hard to change if you, know, if you change the hardware, you change the, the index structure or, or whatever, the, 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 the table uh, design, then how are you going to change the simulation code? Okay, so this is an issue. Um, in the case of smaller buffer, so first of all, we have to understand, right? Why would you want to have a smaller buffer? So uh, according to what one of the guys told me, um, in the enterprise setting, sometimes uh, the, 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 the buffer manager is a black box. You cannot see the reference pattern. What you can see is what are the misses. You can see the, the, the misses coming out of the black box, um, but you cannot see the reference pattern inside the black box. So now, uh, if you change, if you reduce the, the if, if you change the, the, the buffer uh, uh, allocation to a smaller size, uh, why would you do that? Well, you might do that because of server consolidation. Let's say you take two servers, you put it on the same machine, each one of them now gets a smaller buffer, uh, smaller amount of memory. All right, so you have a smaller uh, a buffer, a smaller amount of memory to, to, to play with. Now you're going to predict the number of misses. How do you do that? Uh, if you don't know the reference pattern, you, you know, what was previously a miss, uh, what was previously a hit now becomes a miss. And you never saw the hits. So if you never saw the hits, you never saw the reference pattern, how are you going to predict the misses? So uh, for them, uh, this trace-based approach is going to be a problem to attack uh, the, the, the issue of smaller buffer size. For me, it's not a problem. I uh, just use the equation fitted, do, expo uh, do interpolation, extrapolation backwards uh, rather than forwards. Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So how did you derive M0 in that instance? M0 just fall out of the fit. It's not derived. Okay. So the, the four parameters, when, when you give me a set of data, I, I, the, the equation can be massaged into a linear equation. And then I just take your data and then I fit it, do a regression, I get it. Yeah. So this is what, 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 what I'm trying to get across. The way people have been doing it, doing cache miss analysis all this while is what I call bottom up. I say, give it up. This is not going to work anymore. Let's do it a different way, uh, this top down way of doing it. Um, more than that, I believe that you you can't go on trying to derive a new equation for a new setting. You should try to get one equation that will work all the time. Okay, and the way to do that uh, is through the parameters. So it seems like uh, offhand, a priori, it doesn't seem like it, it should work. But I think I have enough data to make me optimistic about uh, this particular approach working. So this is my goal. I, I, I would like people to look at this, have this, adopt this particular way of attacking the problem, and I hope that you guys uh, will come along and, and, and let's just solve this once and for all. Let's not keep on generating uh, buffer miss equations. Uh, this won't this won't go on forever. Okay, I'll be happy, happy to take uh, more more questions. So, do you have a notion for? I'll call it the compositional mathematics that allows you to take one parameter out of your equation and replace it with, say, three more higher resolution parameters. So for instance, you started with your base model, 
you modified that model when you went to the end stream database buffer. You modified the model a different way when you went to cache set associativity. If you needed to do the composition of database buffers with cache associativity, is there, in other words, is there a kind of a hierarchical refinement that one could imagine where you can reuse some of the fundamental physical modeling parameters from the coarser level and then selectively replace one or two with refined elements so that you're not deriving a new equation for each different instance. Okay. Um, so the question is, <clears throat> let's say you have, a, you have a database workload. I have a database equation. I have a cache, uh, processor cache means equation. Uh, is there some way to integrate these two models to give me a new model to predict the cache means for what is the cache in this case you're talking about? Say set associated. Set associated. Okay, so in that sense, okay, so th the way I see it is that I, I start with the cache means equation for uh, set associative cache and I want to see how my database model can help me refine this. Um, short answer is I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I've never done it. Uh, I don't know how it might work. Um, what the kind of composition that you, you're thinking about, I've tried to work on. Um, let's say uh, I have two compilation workloads. Uh, no, let's say I take the take take a, the same file and I, and I, and I run two compilations simultaneously. No, how would the how would the equation uh, can can I take the two equations and then and and and, and merge them to give me one equation? Uh, things like that, but I've not looked at uh, two different types of equations. Well, I'm also almost yeah. thinking of the taxonomy where you take your initial equation and then in the refined mode you say, in this mode, n0 is no longer a constant. It's replaced by this function and these three additional parameters. And m0 is no longer a constant. It's replaced by this. And so the, the equation grows in complexity as you've added the parameters, but it does it in a way where you could assume some coarse grain approximations and then a series of hierarchical refinements that kind of attempt to recapture the intuition slide that you display. Yeah, so, so your, your point is um, you know, whether, whether I, have, I have some kind of theory for doing this hierarchical refinement that I talk about in the top-down thing. Right now, right off, no. Um, the only thing I tried was for the database case, I don't know how, how that might generalize to uh, other parameters, other workloads. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but yeah, if I've convinced enough people to attack this problem this way, you will see the answer soon, I hope. Yeah. No? Okay, thank you.